It's a privilege to minister the word of God to you today on the eve of the day that we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to have so many of you join us at home, online, and you're so much part of what is taking place today. I'd like to welcome again visitors who are here, some for the first time into our church, some who have come yearly at this time of year because it's special to you, others who are visiting after many years. It's good to see you all and you're so welcome to be here and to be part of our service today. God bless you. Let's welcome everybody who's come to us. So my title today is A Promise Fulfilled. A Promise Fulfilled. The Messiah was promised through many scriptures and prophecies. And this was fulfilled. How should it affect us today that the promise of Messiah was fulfilled? Shortly, we'll look at two blocks of scripture from the book of Luke chapter 2 as our main text. But first of all, what is a promise? A promise, firstly, is a spoken thing normally. Promises can be written, but you normally hear somebody would say, I promise, I commit to. Uh, So they speak it, and do you hear it and understand what they're saying? I looked at the dictionary definition, Merriam-Webster, and again it says a declaration, so it's something that we're doing with our mouths, a declaration that one will do or refrain from doing something. I promise I won't say that rude word to you again. Um, It can be a legally binding declaration that gives a person to whom it is made a right to expect or to claim um, a specified thing. And also, it can be a reason to expect something. And we'll talk a little bit about expectation I think, as we go through the scriptures today. Biblically, a promise is a covenant or a declaration that one will do exactly what they say or something will happen just as it was promised. And we can count on God's promises because of God's character. He never lies. So if he makes a promise, will he not fulfill it? That's one promise we can trust in and rely on. What God says he will do. Unlike us, he's not a man. He doesn't have a fallen nature. I looked up the definition as well in my Strong's Concordance. For those of you who love studying and delving into the words, I won't go through Greek or Hebrew pronunciations. I'm not yet that versed. But... There is a word which means uh, to announce upon, to engage, to do something, to assert something, to profess. So there again is the use of the mouth in promise keeping. A message, oftentimes, in the Bible, biblically, is depicted as. And W.E. Vine says that a promise is a gift graciously bestowed, not a pledge secured by negotiation, but a gift graciously bestowed. The New Covenant Scriptures, uh, the word promise is used in the sense of God's design to visit his people redemptively in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. So here is that promise. I'm going to visit you in the person of Jesus Christ to bring you back to myself. So that's promise. You speak it, you say it. And if it comes from God, we can trust it, that it will come to pass. What about the word fulfilled? Again, from my strong study, you replete um, to level up, to furnish, to satisfy, even diffuse. But to execute or finish something to complete it. There's an end to it. It expires. It fulfills. I'm just looking at some other definitions of um, bring to pass, 
holy reap. In Lamentations 2, verse 17, the first line of that verse says, the Lord has done what he planned. So he promises, he plans, and then he does what he promises. He performs, he finishes. So the promise, the declaration spoken to do something, has been done, is complete, is finished. That's the definition of my title. It's been spoken, declared, and it's completed and finished. The promise fulfilled. Let's go on a journey today. I loved in the singing, I loved in the prayers, I loved in the offering talk and in the communion talk. There was speak, or, or, or there were promises of hope and of joy. We sang the joy of the Lord is my strength and he is my hope. And we hear those words so many times during this Christmas season. The book of Luke, one of the reasons behind Luke's writing of the gospel, and you know that he also wrote the book of Acts, one of the reasons behind his writing was so that new converts would be certain in their faith, that they would know what they believe, and they would not be moved from that. Certain about what what was passed on to them. Certain about what was revealed to them as true. Therefore, certain in the promise of the coming Messiah. And that's the Hebrew word. Or certain of the promise of the coming Christ. That's the Greek word. But both mean anointed one. There was a promise that the anointed one was coming. And that promise came from God. Let's read Luke chapter, six, uh, chapter 2, verses 6 to 14. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. Mary was giving birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a saviour, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. That's our first portion. Our second portion of scripture comes again from Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 32. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and made her pregnant. Isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit leads Simeon to the place where he finds the new baby? The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is so important in these days. Let's not forget that. Verse 27, and he came in the Spirit into the temple And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. Amen and amen. So first, I wanted to speak about those promises which were fulfilled. 
In verse 6 of Luke 2, and while they were there, the time came for her, Mary, to give birth. Mary had an encounter with the angel of the Lord, and she agreed to become pregnant. A young, innocent virgin agreed to become pregnant. She believed in what was said to her and what was to come. And here was the fulfillment. She gave birth to that promised baby that she should bear. In verse 7, it also says that he was laid in a manger. And many of the scriptures in Isaiah, etc., speak of the type of birth that our Christ would have. A lowly birth. A lowly place. So here again, prophecy, promises. The promise is being fulfilled. He's born and he's in a lowly place. In verse 10, the angel's message. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. But the promise here is to what's called the populace of Israel. The angels brought a message to the shepherds to bring to Israel, to the chosen nation of God. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a saviour. So the angels are speaking the promise to the shepherds for one nation, Israel. But um, verse 11 says, a sign. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a saviour who is the Christ. And this will be a sign for you. Angels gave a message to the shepherds to declare Messiah to Israel. The message is good news of great joy. It's news of salvation. That consolation of Israel that Simeon was waiting for. The news was being given to the shepherds. It was being given to those who had broken God's law and were living outside of his will. It also speaks in verse 11 of the city of David. So there are some prophetic declarations in the scripture that prove the fulfillment has taken place. For it says unto you is born this day in the city of David a saviour. And by the way, that word saviour translates as rescuer in the passion translation. It also translates as deliverer. That is God or Christ. So born in this day in the city of David is the deliverer, the rescuer, the saviour. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10, this city of David the shepherds would have been acquainted with the scriptures, with what was spoken of old. Zechariah 12.10 says, And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace or unmerited favour, I read from the Amplified, and supplication. And they shall look earnestly upon me whom they have pierced. They're looking earnestly upon the Christ before his pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for only his son and shall be in bitterness for him as one who is in bitterness for his firstborn so here the angels are declaring that which was already promised in Zechariah chapter 12 a child would be born in the city of David they're also declaring what was prophesied what was spoken earlier on in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, which pointed out Bethlehem as the place where he would be born is a promise being fulfilled. In Micah 5, 2, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, Ephrata, you are little to be among the clans of Judah, yet out of you shall one come forth for me, who is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old and from ancient days. So there Micah makes the declaration that Messiah will come out of Bethlehem. So the angels are declaring that which was already promised. And as I said, a saviour. In this text in in Luke 2, it speaks of a saviour. 
It doesn't name Jesus, but it is Jesus. And, and the title Saviour is equivalent as well to Jesus. So we know the promises are there. And they've been fulfilled. The child has been born. Let's look at a few more scriptures. Isaiah chapter 43. We're going to look at two scriptures in there. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. That's his promise. I have redeemed you. Christ has not yet gone to the cross, but I have redeemed you. There is the promise. Ransomed you by paying a price instead of leaving you captives. Isn't that beautiful? I have called you by your name. You are mine. The Lord is declaring in Isaiah in those days a promise, which at the birth of Jesus Christ began to be fulfilled. Isaiah 43 again in verse 19. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive and know it? And will you not give heed to it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. A correct translation, God says here, is behold, I am doing new. I'm doing something that has never been done before. I'm doing new. And this story is the story of the new that he did. I'm doing new. The last um, scripture that I wanted to share about the promise and being fulfilled. Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 to 16. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise and tread your head underfoot, and you will lie in wait and bruise his heel. This, of course, is the prophetic word that would take place at the fall in the Garden of Eden on this Christmas Eve, through Eve, there's my pun, um, the Messiah still comes. And the promise is that through her offspring, Messiah will come and bruise the head of the enemy. And that the head would bruise the heel of Messiah because he couldn't do much else. Messiah came to save the world. But there is a fulfilled promise. He's now come into the world. As I read earlier on, from Luke uh, 2, verses 31 and 32. What is our part? What has all of that got to do with us? What is this great birth and the prophetic words and the promise have to do with us? Let me just look again at Luke 31 and 32. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, Simeon was speaking. I'll go from 29. Lord, now you are telling your servant, depart in peace according to your word. And here, um, Simeon declares, for my eyes have seen your salvation. That's also a fulfillment of a prophecy. My eyes have seen your defender. I'll just go aside a little bit and read Isaiah 52, 10 here. The Lord has made bare his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, revealing himself as the one by whose direction the redemption of Israel from captivity is accomplished. And all the ends of the earth shall witness the salvation of our God. There's a shift from the children of Israel receiving a message to verse 31 of Luke 2, that you have prepared. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared, that you have made ready, that you have provided, the Amplified says, in the presence of all peoples. That means everyone worldwide. So the angels bring a message earlier in Luke to a people. But Simeon now declares 
that the message is for all peoples. It's for the entire world. And verse 32 says, a light to disclose what was before unknown. New, I'm doing new, disclosing what was before unknown. For revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Note Simeon speaks first of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? Us. Who are the Gentiles? The ones that the early church began to reach when the Jews, when Israel rejected God, rejected that the Christ had come. So what's our part in it? The early church continued the message that the angels brought. Peace and salvation, good news. But God's chosen people rejected the truth of Jesus Christ. And that is why Simeon declared to Gentiles and then to Israel that salvation is for all peoples. Psalm 96 verses 1 to 3. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless, affectionately praise his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. There it is. His marvellous works among all the peoples. So we know that the birth of Christ and the ultimate sacrifice he, he, he paid was for everyone, for all of mankind, for us, for those who still don't yet know Jesus Christ, some sitting in here today, some at home watching online. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, praise the Lord. So I just want to flip back to Isaiah 43, verse 1, where I'd read as a sign, a promise, fulfilled. But now, and I read from the Amplified, because it says in brackets, in spite of past judgments for Israel's sins. And I, I said to myself, what's our place? In spite of past sins... God has redeemed us. Isaiah 43, 19 says, Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it and know it? Our job is to perceive and know, to understand and know, to know, to know that God is doing new and has already done new in our lives. And will you not give heed to it? Will we hear? Will we really know? Will we pay attention that we have a part to play in the birth of Jesus Christ, in the message the angels came to bring, good news that captivity would be released, that people's captivity would be broken? Hallelujah. So... I was doing a little bit of studying in preparing and I wanted to just reiterate our part, therefore. We've heard the promise fulfilled, the reasons why, and why Israel had to hear it from people like us. We must believe first that salvation is for us too. How many of you in here believe that? Yeah, because you're born again. You've accepted Christ. You know it's for you. But that's our starting point. The angels gave their message. And salvation, salvation is for us too. It was to the whole of mankind. It wasn't to the angels who first delivered the message. They have no share in this blessing of salvation because they've done nothing wrong. So they did not need it. But we, mankind, needed it. We have to know um, this, even when going through trials, and though the world seems to be a difficult place to live at the moment, do we know? Do we know? Do we believe in these difficult times, even in this season? Do we believe? One of the quotes I like that I was looking up, I'm going to read it, says, the afflictions of God's people are light, 
compared with the hope to come from the fulfilled promise. So we're going through things, but we're born again. What is that hope? Compared with the hope, with the weight of glory reserved for us, what is the glory of God? All that he has and all that he is is reserved for us. Glory left his throne and came to the earth in the form of a human being so that he could redeem us and buy us back for himself. And the weight of his glory is reserved for us who believe. What is our part in this? We have to convey the joy that came into the world and the peace that comes from our reconciliation with God. Many people, I heard it in the prayers this morning, will be suffering loneliness, will be suffering anxiety. This season can be so difficult. The loss of a loved one during Christmas just becomes bigger sometimes. It just becomes the time where you face it again where you're missing that relative. It's a difficult season, as well as a season of joy. But God is with us, and there's the promise of the weight of his glory that's ours, that we can even experience now in the earth. So I've said all of that to come to the important part of this message. Christ Jesus was born into the earth and it was a joyous time because the nation of Israel and eventually mankind could see liberty coming. But that's because people received the message and they became born again. Many in here, many under the sound of my voice, you are not born again. Salvation has not been received by you. Let me quote from a gentleman called um, McLaren, who was um, a Scotsman, um, very studious in the 1800s, studied Greek and Hebrew, pastored in a Baptist church, wrote amazing things. He wrote this, the incarnation and work of Christ are the highest revelation of God. You can't see God in anything better than the fact that glory and majesty came down to earth and was reborn in the form of a human being. That work of Christ is the highest revelation of who God is. The wondrous birth brings harmony to earth, even in chaos. Think about it. Born of a virgin, but for a reason, for a purpose. It's even difficult to believe that You can be born of a virgin, isn't it? His aim was to glorify his father's name. Jesus came down to earth to glorify the father's name, to establish peace between heaven and earth, and to make manifest God's goodwill to men. What was his goodwill? That we sinned, we fell, and his goodwill is peace to you, forgiveness to you, reconcile with me. He had to become the living sacrifice, Jesus Christ. And he had to die on the cross. Where even now, he is our hope. After the rejoicing with us this season of his birth on earth, people get excited about Christmas. People like to give gifts and to bless people at this time of year. People come to church who ordinarily would not come to church just to respect that season of Jesus Christ's birth. But after the rejoicing, if you will believe and come to know him, then you must accept the work of the cross and the fact that he did die for us. Part of the good news message is that we are outside of the original purpose and will of God. So we must first acknowledge that if we don't know him as Lord and Saviour. That we are outside of the original purpose and will of God. And that all have sinned, as I said, and fallen short of the glory of God. Would you today, if you do not know Jesus Christ, acknowledge 
that you have sinned and fallen short of his original plan and purpose. The gospel message is in totality is that God reconciled us through the work of the cross of the Christ and he has bought us eternal life. There is the promise to rule and reign with him forever. Death loses its sting, its power when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your saviour. He was born to bring life back to us, born to redeem us for himself. This is God's gift to the sinful. Because of his compassion, true joy is peace with God here on earth and eternally. If you would like that today, you know that you have never prayed the prayer of salvation. Or you have and you've not walked with God and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. Bow your heads in here and at home. And if you, this applies to you and you desire Christ, then pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you that I've heard your word today. I thank you that you came down from heaven and you were born in the form of a human being. I thank you that you paid the price for my sin and you died on the cross and bought redemption for me. I repent for my sins, for moving away from and living a life outside of your original plan. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe you are the son of God. And that you rose again. And that now I have eternal life as my portion in your kingdom. In Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.